So this is Sean Dr. A. Uh, personally, I'm in Stanford, and my advisor is Greg Valian uh, at Stanford as well. Uh, it's based on an upcoming stock paper, and the preprint is on our day. OK, so I'll dive straight into the setting. So the standard sequential prediction setting, so you're given outputs x1, x2, up to xt, and your goal is to break xt plus 1. You can think of a bunch of applications, uh, but a good one to have in mind is just language modeling. So Google is pretty good at guessing the next word when I'm typing in text. So and you should think of this example. Basically. So you have some text, and you want to pick the next word, and or maybe a distribution over the next word. Uh, so some things worth noting is that uh, there are different dimensions to this prediction. As in, there's some short-term predictions which are easier to make, say it's predicting the part of speech of the next word. Like, is it a pronoun? Is it a verb? Things like that, which doesn't require you to remember a lot about the past. But there's some longer term structure which is harder to predict. For example, dissolving entities and things like that. So this is something to just keep in mind for later, because we'll be talking a lot about long term dependencies and long term memory. So that modeling is one example. You can think of a bunch of other things, speech, financial forecasting, and so on. So there's been a lot of work on this on the practical side recently. People have come up with a bunch of neural network architectures, LSTMs, neural tuning machines, <coughs> edge models, so on. Many of these things do pretty well on some of these tasks, but uh, we're still uh, lacking long-term memory in most of these applications. <coughs> like, and also, like these things are not properly understood. Where do they actually capture long-term dependencies or not? There have been some papers from the Vision and NLP community which show that, like, on many, uh, on at least some NLP tasks, such as document clustering, uh, just a simple bag of word model with some simple <coughs> model on top actually outperforms uh, state-of-the-art LSTMs. So it's not, and there are many other papers that show that, oh, are these LSTMs actually remembering a lot about the past when they make predictions, or is this basically based on, say, the last five words, something like that. Um, so despite this progress, there's definitely a lot of work to be done on the practical side, and uh, because too long term memory is still lacking. But something which I find really exciting is that there's a lot of interesting theoretical questions as well. And uh, it seems like they can have a bearing on practice and can help uh, inform practitioners and do well on these things. So some things which I like to think about are uh, the question of how much memory you really need to do well. So basically, say you have some distribution, how much you need to remember about the sequence in order to make good predictions about the future. And uh, what kind of memory do you need? So what are problems which require longer term memory versus requiring shorter term memory? For example, recall before we had this problem of predicting, say, part speech, which was much, which required shorter term memory and not too much long term memory. And what memory structures are sufficient to solve these problems, which occur long term and short term memory, respectively? So, what are the computational aspects? Even if we know, okay, we require this much memory, how do we decide what to remember? Because, in principle, this could be computationally pretty challenging. And there's a question of like, how to formally model these problems. What are good metrics to think of? What are good models to have in mind, which can help us uh, understand what's happening over here? So this is a setting. Um, any questions or uh, anything which is not clear so far? So yeah. you're always predicting the next item yeah. from the distribution. Yeah, you're predicting the next item or the distribution of the next item. So you might output some distribution. So just sort of predicting what one. property of the next item. Okay. Just cool. Okay. Uh, I'll jump to some upper bounds. So let me just define some setup before that. Uh, we assume that there is some distribution D over sequences. We don't know this underlying distribution. We get one single draw from D, so an extremely long draw from D. And uh, you will say observe the sequence up to time T, and then your goal is to predict the next uh, output, xt plus 1, or the distribution of xt plus 1, given whatever uh, has happened so far. This is the task. The error metric we consider will be uh, the clear divergence between the the distribution that you predict for the next output, and the optimal prediction given the entire history and the knowledge of the underlying distribution. So this is basically just the probability of xt plus 1 given xt, xt minus 1, everything so far. This is, the, this is the best possible prediction you could make if you know the underlying distribution, if you know everything that has happened so far. So we're competing against this pretty high standard, and we're looking at the KL divergence between these two distributions. And uh, by simple inequalities, so you can relate L1 error and KL divergence by principles inequality. So like any result for KL divergence gives you a result for L1 error, and also for 0 one prediction error, where the goal is to just guess the next word, and you get a reward if you guess it correctly. So this is setup. Uh, this is a setting makes sense, the metric. 
Okay. Uh, the game plan is going to be as follows. In the first pass, we'll consider these uh, sequences D, which are generated from a hidden Markov model, which has k states. Some of you might not have seen a hidden Markov model for some time. So it's a very simple graphical model where you have a Markov chain on k states. Every state has some output distribution associated with it. And whenever, whenever you're in a state, you omit a symbol based on the output distribution of that symbol. And at the next time step, you want to take a transition based on the transition probability matrix of the Markov chain. So in the, part, in the first part, we consider a sequence generated from a hidden Markov model. And the second part, we generalize to arbitrary distribution scheme. And then we, in order to do this, we'll have to parameterize the complexity of the distribution, which will come into play later. OK. So here's a result about, here's a result about uh, hidden Markov models. So the gist is that it says that long-term memory is not necessary for predictions. So what is the result? So the observations are generated from a hidden Markov model with at most k hidden states. That was our setting. Then there is an algorithm which achieves average k letter epsilon. So what is average here? Average is just the average over all time steps. So we recall that we have this long sequence, and we just average the error over this entire sequence. Average k letter epsilon, or L1 error square root epsilon, with respect to these optimal predictions which you can make. And this algorithm only uses the most recent log k over epsilon observations, and some summary statistics of the sequence so far. What is the saying? You only look at the most recent log k over epsilon samples observations, and you can get average k over epsilon uh, over your sequence. Okay. Just clarify, are you assuming k is known? Uh, k doesn't have, I guess you need an upper bound on k to decide the order of the order to this, the, the algorithm needs some upper bound in order to decide how uh, how much it needs to remember because the you remember the most recent log k over epsilon samples, so you need an upper bound. So the summary statistics uh, does it amount to knowing some? Is it a weak weak form of knowing the distribution? Uh, it is a yeah. It's a, it's you know you're trying to learn something about the distribution and like what these summary statistics uh, will come will become clear in the next slide. Basically, they're necessary. You can't do without that. Yeah, if you don't know anything, then you can't make any. Like, if you just see the most recent observations and you don't know anything, what has happened so far? Then, like, then it could be the next output could be anything. But you're making strong assumptions about the underlying chain, right? So we just make we just the only assumption making is that it's a hidden Markov model. But you do, you don't know the hidden Markov model. It's just some hidden Markov model with the most k hidden states. So the outputs could be anything. Okay, let me flip the question around. If if you had to look at like last uh, k instead of log k. Mm -hmm. Can you get away with this assumption of uh, not knowing summary statistics? I don't think so, because the thing is that uh, you still have, if you know the hidden Markov model, then yes, uh, I think basically you, uh, or, or at least order k, so the 2k or something should suffice to nail down where you are in the Markov chain, and that should be good enough to make predictions. But uh, if you if you only have the last k, then I don't think you can, because you can still, uh, you, you can't nail, you, if you don't know anything about the Markov model, you, could, you cannot learn it with only k samples. You need slightly more than k. So yeah, if you have something like k squared or something, then I think it's, you should be able to learn the model, and then you can do it. Yeah, at least information theory. Uh, OK, so what are the main takeaways here? So what this is saying is that you're making good predictions by remembering a very small amount of information about the past. You're only looking at the most recent log k over epsilon observations. And yeah, also another important thing is that you're remembering, your memory is small, but it's also short, in the sense that you're only looking at the most recent observations when you're making your predictions. And another thing is that, which is kind of surprising, is that it's going to depend on any properties of the hidden Markov model. So like for example, you can imagine that if the Markov model is extremely fast mixing, then things should be easy because if things are fast mixing, you probably don't need to remember a lot to make good predictions because anyways, you forget where you are. Uh, the Markov chain forgets where it was very quickly. But the interesting thing is that even if you are, uh, if you can be as slow mixing as you want, but you still only need to look at these most recent log over epsilon observations to make good predictions. And uh, maybe I should, so what is the algorithm which actually gets this? Maybe that will make things slightly clearer. The algorithm is extremely simple and uh, it's just a naive engram model. What's an engram model? The well, Nenner model is a Markov model over a window of length n, which at time t predicts using the conditional distribution given the past n observation. So it just predicts using probability of xt plus 1 
given the previous n observations. So px t plus 1 given xt minus n to t, and t is that used true distribution of the data. So all it's doing is that it's like simple Markov model which looks at these previous n things and outputs an x symbol based on the conditional distribution of what you've seen so far. And it's assumed that you've seen enough to have good summary. Yes, yeah, so that's the next one. Yeah. So so you you in fact you probably don't know the true distribution to begin with. So what do you do in that case? So basically your next result says that that's not a problem, you can basically do as well. So now in, in this case, you use empirical statistics instead of the true distribution. So a result says that if these observations are generated from an HMM with most hidden states as before, then you have this long sequence x1 to x capital T, then on average over uh, t, so you choose t uniformly at random from the sequence, then given x1 to xt, this naive n gram model based on empirical probabilities also achieves the same L1 error. So it L1 achieves L1 error square root epsilon with n equal to log k over epsilon, just remembering the last log k over epsilon things. And we assume that this capital T is pretty large, and we'll come back to this later. So what is this empirical model? So all it's doing, okay, so you're getting this extremely large, large long sequence. You count these, how many times each n length window is occurring. So you count the statistics of each n length window. And uh, when you're making a prediction, you look at the past n symbols, and you predict the next symbol based on just the conditional, empirical conditional probability of the next symbol. So like, for example, like think of something like text, you just have this extremely long thing, you just get this one long sample, just learn some statistics uh, of these n gram probability distributions, and then you predict using them. And the, the KR bound is gone because you might assign zero to something that you haven't seen. Yeah, so the KL is some very minor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the okay. KL bound, at least I'm, I'm not sure if uh, yeah, something like that can be a problem. Basically, like it can KL can be extremely large. So it seems I don't know if you can get KL over here because essentially the problem is that the loss could be arbitrarily high if you miss something. So that's the reason at least why we can't get KL. But uh, in terms of the element bound, it's still the same. I guess maybe if you have an upper bound on the alphabet size, then you can assign some minimum thing and you can get some trivial. So the so next symbol is completely new, you will have infinite, right? I guess this is what I'm talking about. Right. Yeah, so the AC is saying that if you know some lower bound, on, like if you have, say, some prior of these uh, engram properties and you start with this prior and then you update your prior or something like this, then maybe, but at least, like, yeah, this extremely simple here. Yeah. You can get still get pretty good L1 and then L1 implies 0, 1. So I think it's still pretty, uh, pretty strong in itself. Um, and uh, also, like this metric of average error is basically what people use most of the time in practice. Like usually, things are trained on average error. So, um, yeah, it, it tells you something interesting for that. So, is it known how to find it using only k states rather than k to the power one or seven? Uh, oh, just using log k instead of log k by itself. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you'll basically generate. Um, K to the power one over epsilon states, right? By taking n grams. K to the power one over, K to the power one over epsilon states. The alphabet size to the power log k over epsilon. Uh huh. Yep. Uh, oh, so I see. Is, is it known how to do construct HMMs with sort of a okay. almost optimal number of first states? Yeah. So like, we come to this. So basically, we show like we show that this is optimal. Basically, you cannot uh, you you cannot. Uh, so we are actually we won't be constructing an HMM here. Yeah. We our prediction is just a Markov model. So we just learn these statistics. I think if you wanted to learn an HMM, <coughs> things would probably get more complicated. Like uh, learning HMMs uh, in general is not as well uh, understood. Uh, so like, the good thing here, we, the predictor is extremely simple. It's just this n-gram model, which is computationally empty. So it's not known how to find HMMs with the right number of states. Uh, information theoretically, I guess you can do it just by doing a search. But yeah, not it's not known. Yeah, it's not known for all the Yeah. So there's no guarantee. It's not guaranteed to find it, right? No. no, no. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, and uh, yeah, so it might seem that yeah, the sample size is pretty large because it depends exponentially on log k. But uh, we'll come back to this later. <coughs> and also know that this, at least this requirement makes sense from the point of view of the n gram model because if you have an n gram model over log k over epsilon window, then the number of parameters it has is alphabet size raised to log k over epsilon. So we expect. At least the NGAM model requires something like this. It's not clear whether this should be necessary or not. Okay, so uh, so what is what is actually happening here? So it looks like when we conjecture this, we we didn't actually believe, this, believe that this should be true. And the reason is that, like, even if you consider say something very simple, 
consider the output just being a repeating length k sequence. So you have this like simple cycle, and then you keep recycling for this. Okay, where is and you keep repeating these. So it's clear that at least you can have dependencies over pretty long time scales, right? So if you just have if the cycle was just one single one and then all zeros, then you have dependencies over k time scales. So you need to remember, look at the past k things to guess the future correctly in the worst case at least. And like what you can imagine is that oh, there might be some first case uh, pseudo random sequence for which like even on average it might be hard to predict. So uh, let's try to understand, understand this a little bit more. So okay, so what are we actually saying over here? So in this case, notice that the optimal predictor gets zero error because it uh, it it can see everything, so it knows exactly where you are in the cycle, so you can guess the next output uh, with zero error. And what we are claiming is that you can get error epsilon based on uh, looking at the past uh, log k over epsilon samples, log k over epsilon observation. So it's like length k cycle, and you're looking at only the most recent log k uh, observation is still doing pretty well. So it's not a simple case. So if the sequence is random, then this should be possible, right? Because if this length k sequence is chosen at random, and with very high probability, every two log k log is going to be unique. Just by simple union bar. And uh, if every block of length 2 log k is unique, then you can predict well by just looking at the most recent log 2 log k observation because then that is a unique identifier for where you were in the sequence. And if you know where you are in the sequence, then you can predict exactly. And as it's a, so the 2 log k, 2 log k bar uh, is unique, just follows from basically this union bar. So yeah, it's not, it's not anything complicated. This makes sense, right? So at least for random sequence, we don't expect to need more than two log k observations to predict. Uh, so what's the what's happening for uh, worst case sequences? So the intuition is this as follows: so at every time step, either of two things is happening. So uh, one scenario is where you predict the next output correctly. So if you predict correctly, that's all good. But in that case, you don't get a lot of information about where you were in the sequence or where the sequence actually was. But if you input it incorrectly, then you learn a constant fraction of a bit of information about where the sequence actually was. So intuitively, what do we expect? OK, so there are k hidden states. So uh, we need like log k bits to in order to nail down which hidden state uh, you are in. So and each, so basically you can afford to make, or you will make something like order log k error, because with each error, you're getting some fraction of a bit of information about where you are. So something like log k you expect to be able to learn. And that's the, that's the intuition, at least. Uh, so I think I, have, I can go into a little bit more detail. But is the, um, yeah, the last one have a, just, you don't just have a cycle, you have a graph, right? Yeah. Oh, if you have a graph, I guess the cycle is in some sense. So if you have a graph, then uh, if you say it thinks this, if this thing was more connected, then it becomes. Uh, then it mixes more quickly. So it, in some sense, then uh, things become easier for you because if things mix quickly, things mix quickly, then uh, you don't need to, uh, then the past is not as valuable for making a prediction about the future if things are mixing quickly. So it's the slow mixing case, which intuitively seems like it should be the worst at least because that's where you expect to need a lot of information about the past to nail down where you are. Okay, so go over like a very uh, <coughs> almost silly toy example, which will at least explain the intuition. So again, the setup is the same. We have these observations, and uh, our goal is to find the average error of this naive n-gram model over window over window spanning from x u to x n minus one. So recall that the n-gram model just predicts based on the conditional probabilities based on what it has seen so far. So the first insight is to look at instead of looking at this n-gram model. Look at this predictor, which only looks at the past uh, e observations when making the prediction at time d. So what, I, what am I saying over here? So the n-gram model always gets the previous n observations. Instead of analyzing this, I'll analyze this model, which looks at, which gets the observations from time zero to t, time t minus one, where t is less than n, and making the prediction at time t. So I'm giving it less information, but I want to like basically instead of analyzing this thing which has like these shifting windows, I want to analyze this thing which like gradually uh, gets longer and longer windows. And uh, the idea is that this, in average, this can't improve your performance. 
because you are getting short less information. You are getting shorter histories than this entire model, which got which always got the past n observations when making this prediction. Okay, so so the next step is to instead of thinking about this uh, Markov model, we think about something else. So the idea is that the data generating distribution is actually a hidden Markov model. Then the naive Markov model, which uses the conditional distribution probability xt given x zero to t minus one. This is the same as this predictor which we we'll call p short, which knows the underlying HMM, but only looks at the past few observations at every time step. So why is this the case? Because no, like basically the prediction of p short at any time t, given these observations x zero to x t minus one, is exactly probability x t given x zero t minus one if the probability distribution if it exactly knows the underlying the Markov model because it's exactly what the distribution is. Okay, so we have this predictor p short. And we are comparing with this oracle uh, which we call p opt, which also knows the hidden Markov model, but it knows the entire history. And one way to encapsulate the history up to time zero is to say that it knows the hidden state of time zero because that's all the information there is in the history. Okay, so we have these two things now. Both p opt and p short know the hidden Markov model. In addition, p opt also knows the hidden state of time zero, which p short does not know. So after seeing each observation, what, what will p opt try to do? p opt will try to update this posterior of the hidden state at time zero. Say so initially you think that, oh, the hidden state could have been any of the uh, k possible hidden states. Every time we'll try to get an observation and we'll try to refine its posterior belief about what the hidden state could have been at time zero. The idea is that we want to analyze how long will it take for the posterior to peak. So once, once the posterior peaks on the two hidden state at time zero, then the predictions of p opt and p short are the same because they both know the same thing, right? They don't have HMM, they have the same belief about the hidden state at time zero, so they make the same predictions. What do you mean by peak? Uh, peak uh, as in the probability mass on the hidden state at time zero, on the true hidden state at time zero will become high. So the posterior will become concentrated on the true hidden state at time zero. So, so this posterior, uh, maybe there's a graph of the next period. It'll make Not sense. every HMM is going to have that property, but if yeah, you yeah. have that property, yeah, you're yeah. arguing that it's actually easy. Uh, I mean, it's not, it doesn't have to. So the thing is that okay. if you, whenever you make an error, your posterior is going to be jumping ahead a little bit, but whenever you make an error, the posterior will peak a little bit. And the point is that if you make a lot of error, then your posterior will actually become peak. If it never peaks, then things that you never made any errors. So then you were good anyways. So basically what we'll argue is that either of two things will happen at every time step. Either you'll make an error, in which case you'll actually get some information about the true hidden state at time zero. And that will help you make better, better predictions in the future. So in the next time step, then you'll make slightly better predictions. If that doesn't happen, if you don't make an error, then you're anyways good because you didn't make an error. So uh, your error wasn't high anyway. So finally, we try. We have an argument which will take care of both of these things. Okay. Okay. So again, let's go back to this, this toy example. So the underlying hidden Markov model is just uh, this cycle over sixteen hidden states. Each hidden state outputs one or a zero depending on its label. So now in the beginning, uh, this predictor p short, which did not know the hidden state at time zero. Leaves that yeah, the hidden state could have been any of these 16 hidden states. So the posterior is just uniform over all of these hidden states. So it's extremely flat, not peak is what I'm saying. This is the posterior. Now, yeah, I'll also circle the states on which the posterior has support in red to make things slightly easier to follow. Okay, so what happens at time zero? At time zero, you think that okay, the output can be zero or one with equal probability because you don't know anything. And uh, because then there are eight ones and eight zeros in this cycle. So you predict that output can be one with 50% chance, zero with 50% chance. Say you say the hidden state at time zero is actually this one at 12 o'clock. Then the true predictor, which knows the hidden state at time zero, knows that the output is always going to be a one. So you have a very high error at time t equal to zero. But the good thing is that now you know that the the state, the hidden state at time zero could only have been one of these states uh, which had a one. So you in some sense now your posterior is more peaked on the true hidden state at time zero. And that's basically what is going to happen in the future as well. So let's say in the next time step, it so happens, okay, the error is low because most of these ones happen to be followed by, a zero, followed by a zero. So the error is low, but also the posterior is almost the same as it was before. We go to the next time step, and the next time step, your error is actually high because you 
and you predict that the output can be one with a higher chance because one zero one is more likely than one zero zero over here. So there is high, but now you know that you're in one of these two states which are labeled as a one. And that's the intuition basically. So in the next time step, you make zero error because both both of these one zero zeros are followed by one. But in the final time step, the error is high, but now you exactly know the two hidden state at time zero. In some sense, like it's like this sort of mixture of experts kind of thing. So you have these all these experts, and every time step you try to you refine your belief as to what the which was the right expert or which was the right hidden state, and then uh, that's what is happening in this case, at least. So the intuition is that um, we can analyze this argument, show that with W log k mistakes, uh, your posterior will be. So you can only make like, <coughs> log k, so log k mistakes, so the error over a C log k window will be 1 by C. Yeah. As well come back to this point. So yeah. I mean, in general, the the output of the output is a stochastic function of, mm -hmm. of the Lincoln state, mm -hmm. um, and here you're you're making an argument that you'll be able to identify the Lincoln state. But the noisier that is, that output distribution is, it, it, it can make it impossible to actually identify the Lincoln state. Is the argument though that in that case the optimal predictor is also exactly. is, is hopelessly exactly. lost? Yeah. Okay. If the output is extremely noisy, yeah. then uh, then the optimal There's prediction the, was also yeah. extremely yeah. noisy. So you didn't have to do much to well. So like you now you can finally you can analyze this or like via potential function and martingale argument. I'll quickly go over this. So it's called UT, this posterior of the true hidden state after seeing the observations up to time t, that E D be the L1 error at time t. So our potential function is going to be log of ut by one minus ut. So it's basically if the potential function is high, this means that the posterior is on ut is actually posterior on the true hidden state is very high. Which means that you're you're uh, very confident in your belief of the true hidden state at time zero, and the idea is that uh, the expected change in this potential function is at least uh, the error squared. So if your error is high, then you, the potential function also improves by law. This follows from uh, some inequalities, and then basically finally we set up a sub martingale, and then we use martingale concentration uh, to get at least the first uh, set that I told you about. Okay, so is there a picture from the HMMs make sense? Any questions at this point? So why did you choose this particular form of uh, a potential? Uh, is there any intuition behind that? Like why would it? So yeah, I guess like it turns out that this, uh, well, yeah, I mean, we didn't start with this, but this like this gives us what we want very, in a very extreme <laughs> fashion. <laughs> Uh, like I, I like the intuition is basically the fact that you want to you want some potential function which can characterize how how confident you are in the belief of the true hidden state at time zero, because it, that will give you how much error you can you will incur on average in the next time step. So at least that's the intuition, and then this form of log u by one minus u uh, is for like making things work nicely and clearly. Does it have anything to do with optimizing the KL divergence? Yes, it does. Because this, uh, like you finally get some KL divergence, then you use spin skulls to get L1. So, yeah, it plays a nice shape with the KL. And what is the submartingale over? Uh, so, submartingale basically you say that if you have uh, uh, like the, this sort of property where the expected change uh, is non negative, so the expected change is always positive, then you can try to uh, say that the difference between this what you started with and what you ended up with cannot be too large. Over the E sub T is? The expected over the output that you get. So, um, but what's the variable in the summer meal? So, the variable would just be uh, x minus, uh, so this basically just what exactly the xt plus 1 minus xt minus epsilon t squared. This will be the, the variable. And then you'll look at the expected change will be non negative, and then we we'll use some article concentration. It's basically exactly the variable. So the change in your potential function minus the error that you incur. Basically, these two things cannot be very much separated from each other. The error is high, then the change is also high. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's all about HMMs. But uh, we want to be more general than HMMs. So in order to go beyond HMMs, uh, we first need to define notion of complexity. So for HMMs, we have this notion of the number of hidden states. 
Uh, for general sequences, we define this notion of the mutual information between the entire past and the entire future. So what is this? It's just a mutual information between, so to pick any time t, choose the mutual information between all the outputs from x minus infinity to x t minus 1, and all the future outputs from x t to x infinity. So this, like these two sets of random variables, you look at the mutual information. That'll be our notion of complexity. And uh, this captures the, the amount of dependency in the sequence, I mean, like how many dependencies are getting carried forward. Though, uh, interesting thing is, it doesn't care about whether these dependencies are long range or short range. All it cares about is how many dependencies there are. And it turns out that it doesn't actually matter from the perspective of average error. From the perspective of average error, you only care about the number of dependencies, and not if these dependencies are long range or short range. How is the mutual information defined? Uh, what's yeah. the T for that? Yeah, yeah. So mutual information, so in general, mutual information between any two random variables is just like the it measures the amount of information which one has about the other. It's just the entropy minus the conditional mm -hmm. entropy. That's fine, but how, yeah. is, how is the, the random variable T defined for that? Oh yeah, so yeah, that's a good point. So if it's stationary, then you can pick any time T and this will be the same. If it's not, this is the definition for stationary. If it's not stationary, then you take an average over the entire sequence and that'll be the definition. Like, so it's like in expectation over T, basically. Okay. And then you can get a, a pretty uh, simple result, uh, which then gets you a similar sort of characterization. So this naive n gram model, which only looks at the past n observation, and again, you get average scalar of epsilon with respect to these optimal predictions, the same optimal predictions we defined before. For uh, the spindle length equal to mutual information upon epsilon. So you only look at the most recent mutual information upon epsilon observations, and then you get uh, average error epsilon. Yeah. So I guess for KHM observations, it's okay. Yeah. So basically, that's a, that's a direct corollary because for HMMs, uh, the hidden state encapsulates all the information about the past. There are k hidden states, then there are log k bits of information, at most log k bits of information. and uh, so information information is at most log k for HMMs. And the so the mutual information is like a, a limit as some window grows of the average mutual information for t within that window. Yeah, yeah. So basically, over like defined over like is exactly what you said. Yeah. And if that shifts over time in the sequence. Yeah. So I guess like we uh, so over here like if it. If it shifts over time, then you'll have to define the result for like the mutual information for uh, a particular value of the sequence length, and then the result will be in terms of that parameter. So it will be parameterized by the sequence length and stuff like that. So, but the easiest thing to think about at least is when uh, say things are stationary. So you don't need to worry about uh, uh, how you choose this time step. And the, the number of samples that you need is the same alphabet size raised to the n -ish thing? Yeah, so this will be the number of things. So the thing is that here you need to get different draws. So at least like this result right now is not in terms of just having one long sequence, and then you predict based on that. So uh, you can make it in terms of that if you assume stationarity. But without stationarity, you need uh, independent draws from the distribution, and then you need same number of here. Alphabet size is to reach an information by epsilon cross. So, other than HMM with k hidden states, are there other interesting classes of uh, underlying generative processes where this result would be uh, so I guess, more palatable? Yeah, uh, good question. So, I guess like if, uh, if you have a general hidden marker model, sorry, general graphical model, uh, then I, yeah, you can use the same sort of argument. Uh, to argue that uh, this, the entropy can be at most log of the number of states in the graphical model, and then uh, say that the mutual information is at most log k. Now, so what are the uh, other settings would we like to think about? Mm. Mm, I guess for Marco models, you can also say something that that's not. Uh, I'm any more interesting than hidden marker models. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't have like any good other sequential models off the top of my head, but I think this should be, getting some upper, upper bound should be not very complicated once you specify a sequential model. I think so. For example, for say 
things like these are the arima things that people that use in statistics. I think this order over of the uh, of the arima model should basically be this mutual information, at least like ignoring the uh, or some polyurn model. <laughs> Like old kind of yeah, yeah. So, I guess in um, in maybe like old style language modeling from the eighties or something, where there were um, uh, these ngram models, they're almost always specified as like fallback models. Where if you have sort of like n uh, length history that you can look up, you use it. Otherwise, you look for n minus one. Yeah, yeah. You always have these style yeah. these moving approaches. And so, if it if there's a if there's a property on the um, Kind of predictive power of um, values n prime less than n. Um, does it suggest that there's a sort of a more efficient version of the algorithm that just keeps um, uh, mm -hmm. empirically might not have to look back yeah. so far? I think without more assumptions, like so, we'll come to the lower ones next. Without more assumptions, you won't be able to get rid of the sample like this, yeah. as many samples as you as bit size based mutual information by epsilon. But that's a good point. Like we. Yeah, we, we thought a little bit more about what assumptions will uh, get us around the lower bound, get better sample complexity, and something like yeah. Uh, so there are some generative models which I think lead to these all these maze and may style smoothing approaches. So it's a good point. Yeah, I, I I think it should be possible to get some better sample complexity if you assume some more structure, like what people assume for these uh, smoothing models. Just a quick clarification. Um, yeah. And so, do you think of like these fallback models as as something in the underlying dynamics, or as part of the estimation procedure? I mean, it's the way I was thinking about it as part of the dynamics, so that that gives you then some control control over the sample complexity. I think there are like basically you can specify generative models which lead to these dynamics. Basically, uh, then you can probably get some better sample complexity. Yeah, it seems like it would have to be something. <clears throat> okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, some quick takeaways from <clears throat> from the bounds. So the <clears throat> the <clears throat> sorry. So the memory requirement. Uh, so basically, we show that like this memory requirement that you need not to make good predictions. So. We see this question that we asked in the beginning about how much you need to remember to make good predictions. <clears throat> this memory requirement basically says that there's mutual information in the sequence or the amount of dependencies that are there in the sequence. It's kind of intuitive that yeah, you how many dependencies there are, you need to look at that many past observations. But there's also like some like uh, if you like communication complexity, then there's some subtle con connection between the fact that if you wanted to write down enough information to be able to simulate the entire future. The amount of information you need to write down could be exponential in the mutual information actually. So you can talk more about this offline if you're interested in communication complexity stuff. Second takeaway, as you also said, is that uh, Marco models do quite well. And some of these things were uh, pretty much state of the art till like 10 years or so ago before the before the networks came along. And this maybe explains some of the success about like yeah, why you can do pretty well just by looking at the most recent things and uh, taking some summary statistics of the past observations. And yeah, probably the most important thing I would say would be uh, that yeah, it says that in order to get good predictions on average across time, you don't need long-term memory. So it suffices to only remember the most recent things if you are only interested in doing well on average. Okay. But the yeah, the amount of memory in the in the um, uh, summary statistics is exponential. That's true. So you you're remembering a lot of summary statistics, but I guess you once you uh, once you learn these statistics, and then if, you, if they don't change too much, then you don't need to. Uh, then it's basically like in some sense you're you're training your model uh, in the beginning, say by learning all these summary statistics, and then you're making predictions in the future. So it yeah, at least at like when prediction time in some sense, like you're not looking at a very long sequence of the past to make a prediction. Though I guess yeah, you do you are like keeping all these summary statistics along, but in some sense that's also necessary. You show that yeah, you actually you need this much. You definitely need some summary statistics in order to do anything because then otherwise you don't have any information. You also argue that yeah, uh, in general you will need this much, uh, these many samples, and that'll be the lower bounds which you come in next. 
So, so just yeah. one, one question about Jana. So, is the analysis robust? Suppose uh, going back to Rina's point, yeah. if I were to maintain the summary statistics in an approximate way or, uh, or throughout like some small counts, right? Is the analysis robust enough to handle that? I think like if you so basically all uh, so the way we are maintaining these statistics is by just storing these counts right. of all of these n length windows that you've seen so far in the sequence. So I think like anything which argues which will let you say that. Like in some sense, if the L1 error between the true like, true statistics of the counts and what you're storing is small, then you should be fine. So at least you can throw away small things and things like that. Um, yeah, like you can probably do like these at least these uh, minor things to get some improvement. But yeah, in worst case, you do need to keep around this much. Basically, you can't compress. Uh, okay. So I go on to these uh, lower bounds, which will uh, explain some of these data requirements, maybe. So we show that the, this n model is optimal uh, in the following two senses. So information theoretically, if any model just looks at the previous n observations, then it cannot get better than uh, this n model. So this basically just because saying that yeah, you're extracting as much information about the past n observations as you can, or in some sense, the analysis of the n model is optimal. The most the more interesting part is the computation of the bound. We show that there's, there's if any efficient algorithm which does well on average requires at least alphabet size raised to log k over epsilon, log k over the error epsilon samples in order to get error epsilon. And then we call that this naive Markov model has these many parameters, alphabet size raised to log k over epsilon, and hence requires these many samples. So let me describe the computation of the bound first. So okay, so we say that. Assuming some uh, complex peak conjectures about strongly refuting certain classes of CSPs, we show that there exist families of Peter Markov models which have k states and observations drawn from an alphabet of size, alphabet of size d, such that any polynomial time algorithm needs at least d raised to log k over epsilon samples to get average k over epsilon. So uh, at least if you, in the worst case, if you are restricted to be uh, computationally efficient, then you cannot get rid of this sample complexity requirement. But yeah, you. Um, maybe if you uh, make some more assumptions about the market model or about your inputs, you can say something better. Uh, this is interesting because uh, this is a no, this is a computation lower one because information theoretically, if you have a hidden Markov model with k in states, then it has k squared parameters in the transition matrix, k d parameters in the observation matrix. So up to epsilon factors, order k squared by k d samples are sufficient. So information theoretically, you don't need that many samples actually. But uh, if you have to be computationally efficient, you need to actually, based on some complexity conjecture. What, what's the sample here? A uh, sample here is basically this uh, you're seeing all the, this extremely long sequence, and what is the length of the sequence have to be? In order the to length be. of the sequence. Yeah. Okay. Or you can also think of like you're getting different draws from the sequence, independent draws, and how many draws you need to get. Something like. Uh, and in each draw, what do you get? You get the entire prefix. Uh, then you, yeah, you get, say, you get some, each draw will be. Uh, all of the prefix up to time takes it. Then how many prefixes okay. you're doing? Yeah, but like, maybe it's easier to just think of like one long draw. Like that. Yeah. Can you say again what the sub subscript in the below means with the epsilon? So oh, I, I guess I'm hiding some uh, factors in epsilon. So it's the best multiplicator or what? Uh, I think it will be, uh, it should be, yeah, it should be multiplicated, like some poly factors in epsilon because all. In order to argue this, what you'll basically say is that uh, it's like standard epsilon net covering argument. You have case group plus KD parameters, you do a covering, and then uh, <coughs> you have uh, uh, like two raised to K squared plus KD by epsilon. Uh, different. You can take a epsilon net of sizes, and I'll cover all epsilons. And then, uh, so information theoretically, these many samples will be sufficient. Well, there's some. Uh... Or a tensor-based algorithm for finding epsilon. Yeah, but you need assumptions on. So you need a transition matrix to be full rank. You need the observation matrix to be full rank. So you need uh, you need assumptions on the epsilon to in order to be able to run. So what is the uh, how do you encode roughly the CSP? Yeah, the I, uh, it's a, it's not a complicated idea. So basically, what we say is that uh, I think I should have time to maybe just describe the CSP. So we have this, or maybe not actually. So you'll have the CSP, and then we'll basically say that uh, the the task will be to predict uh, some function. You'll actually have multiple CSPs in some sense. You'll, you'll get some uh, 
quickly. Yeah, maybe I can. Yeah, I can quickly go over this maybe. So, uh, so I'll probably skip all the introductions to CSP and stuff. And, uh, so the task is going to be something like this. Uh, sorry, if this doesn't make sense. I I had to skip a bunch of uh, items in between. But uh, so the idea is that um, the task will be to distinguish between two distributions of CSPs. One will be a random CSP, where uh, uh, so so it'll actually be a random KXOR where you generate all clauses uniformly at random. And the other one will be a KXOR with a planted assignment. So the planted assi so how do you generate uh, clauses from this? You fix some planted planted assignment. And, you, and then you randomly sample clauses which satisfy the planted assignment. So it's going to be these two distributions. The, and the encoding is going to be basically you, for the first, say, if you have clay clauses, and the first k time steps, you output these literals. And then you output, say, um, functions of like the truth values for uh, multiple functions, like multiple k XOR functions, basically. So, and then that, you know, to get the outputs correctly, you need to learn the, you need to solve the CSP. Uh, we can talk more. I guess uh, it, it's not it's not complicated, but probably take two or three lines to write down to make it clear. Okay. Uh, probably uh, skip over some of these things. So basically, this uh, this is the conjecture about the uh, hardness of CSP. So basically, some recent stuff which has come about uh, about that if you any polynomial time record any polynomial time algorithm requires uh, a lot of samples. It's the number of samples depending on some complexity parameter of the CSP to distinguish between counted instances and random instances of the CSP. It's been proved for some certain classes of algorithm. Okay, so let me actually skip this and uh, move to uh, the end, basically. Okay, so what do we say? So I do want to say that this memory requirement scales for the mutual information of the sequence. Which is nice. So we have some answer about like how much you need to remember to make good predictions. And interesting, perhaps the more interesting part is that to make good predictions on average, you don't need to remember long-term information. Short-term information is sufficient to make good predictions. We also showed some low bounds saying that yeah, uh, these at least uh, in the worst case, these data requirements are optimal among efficient algorithms. And uh, so you can interpret these results either in a positive sense or a negative sense. So you can also think of it as a good positive result because it's saying that it's pretty, it's not hard to predict well. So it's a very simple uh, computationally empty algorithm essentially. It's not doing anything complicated. So remembering a very small amount of information and it's predicting uh, pretty well on average. So, in for example, settings like OCR or like uh, tasks which, uh, like say, uh, average error is a very good notion for, like, say, financial forecasting and things like that. Then this is in some sense a nice result because it says that it's not hard to do well. But it's also a negative perspective on average error. And this is, I think, the intuition which I like, I like the detail which I like to take from this. Because uh, for many tasks, we we believe that long-term dependencies are in some sense necessary to understanding language. And uh, uh, intelligence is in some sense the ability to know what is important and what is not important. So uh, basically say that yeah, so average error is like a almost the most common metric used in practice is pervasively used. And this basically is the question of how should we articulate the value of long-term memory. So, and I think that if you have better notions, then it's also, it probably will be easier to train algorithms which can uh, leverage long-term information better than what we're doing right now. Um, well, it's, uh, uh, it's not HMM, it may not be right? It may not be an HMM. So the result is about, uh, like it, it can be parameterized in terms of this mutual information parameter. Yeah, so basically for anything which has limited mutual information, remembering only the most recent things is sufficient to make good predictions. So yeah. if, if I have a um, sequence distribution yeah. that is approximated to a certain level by a k-state HMM, then what do I know about what the how well the yeah, engrams will do? I think, again, you can basically say that if you can approximate it uh, up to some error epsilon in a lower distance by a case HMM, then the result basically follows just by using some triangular inequality uh, and basically on top of the present result. So if you can approximate the distribution well by a case state HMM, then uh, you're also basically fine in terms of like uh, you, the engram model will do pretty well on average. 
So it's sort of a dumb question. Yeah. If, interpret, if you understood the result right, yeah. you're saying that um, let's even take a binary alphabet. Yeah. Right. You are factoring out how much of the past do I need to remember? Yeah. And how much of the global statistics I need to know? Yes. Right? Yeah. So there is still a two to the one over epsilon square lookup yeah, yeah. table you need. Yeah, yeah, you're remembering so, some statistics. Yeah. Right. So the positivity <laughs> is kind of with the huge caveat that you need a huge lookup table. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't say it's uh, so. I guess in some sense you can think of like yeah, in uh, you could require these many samples in the worst case, but I think like for example, what many of these smoothing algorithms do is basically try to estimate the summary statistics with much fewer data. So in practice, like yeah, even five gram models over like a five gram language model is you can't get uh, that width size is large enough that you probably won't be able to get enough samples to actually estimate it. So but I think one of a lot of the like smoothing things try to do on top of this is to basically lower down the sample complexity. So I think that this uh, requirement of maintaining summary statistics, I think, is not um, extremely rigorous because, yeah, in practice, what you would probably do is try to smooth things so that you don't actually remember, you don't actually have to store these many things. And also, like, yeah, you have algorithms which can do some fallback and try to do this lookup efficiently as well. But you might need to go beyond statistics, right? You might need to store stack and memory and data structures. Yeah, yeah, you know, to actually be able to access this efficiently, I guess. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, like, uh, may not be able to achieve everything in this while staying in this framework of, and, uh, of just keeping the statistics of of n maps. Yeah, yeah, I think. Like, uh, like you implementing the next uh, token in a program, you need a stack, right? You see, uh, mm. not able to get away by just. I think yeah, I think you'll probably need something on top, but I think still remembering uh, things which only depend on n things are like so basically still remembering only order n statistics should be fine. But you might need to do it in a different way. For example, yeah, you have some sort of way to fall back to if you don't have uh, the property of this particular sequence, how do you fall back to uh, something which then uh, uh, you can use to make predictions? And you need a you need some table to be able to do that, but I think still order and information should be fine. You shouldn't be have to maintain the longer thing necessarily. Yeah, uh, I mean just just on this last point, I mean you yeah. can imagine a lot of settings, language or interacting with the user where something they've done long in the past. Yeah, it, it's you know there will be a whole bunch of stuff that happens. It's changing the underlying state. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, in some sense, you could forget about it, like on average, in order to make a kind of a, yeah. a good prediction of what's going to happen. But it's like it's super critical in terms of the value, the cost of getting that prediction yeah. wrong. Right. Yeah. So in some sense, some of this memory is much more valuable. Yeah, absolutely. And, I think that's basically, but, for example, if you're doing yeah. language modeling, then predicting uh, articles is not that uh, difficult, but that gives you good returns on average because uh, articles. Yeah, are right. right. And, yeah. And we, and we don't really. Yeah, care don't really care as much about it. Right. I mean, there's, there's like, it, you know, so now you turn this into a basically in not an HMM, but a Palm DP where there's kind of a cost associated with the, the predictions that you're making, the reactions that you're yeah. taking, right? Um, and there's a fair amount of literature on belief state representation, kind of compressing it, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, even information model style to just yeah. extract what information yeah. is necessary to make them valuable yeah. Prediction predictions as opposed yeah. to the. the just yeah. arbitrary predictions. Yeah, yeah. I think those things are uh, the uh, yeah the. I think the takeaway should be that yeah you need to uh, consider other notions other than just average error. For example, things like that, which can appropriately weigh the fact that there's some outputs which are maybe more uh, right. uh, valuable predictions, which are more valuable to make than some other predictions. Yeah, last question. So you've been focusing most on the how much history you need, right? Yeah. But instead, if you parameterize the, I think many people have talked about like space complexity, how much information you need to store, mm -hmm. what would that translate to in terms of the complexity of the distribution of the underlying? So the space as in uh, how much memory? I don't care how far you look. I think that's not my parameter. I just need to store how much summary statistics, right? Mm -hmm. That's my complexity. Yeah. What would be the corresponding i? Sort of i would be something mm -hmm. else. So, I guess it's like if the entropy of the sequence is small now, it's like so. If you go to entropy instead of meter, <laughs> then you should be able to compress these things more because then 
like these and some of these some of these statistics are more compressible. So you can probably then do uh, uh, something on top of this in order to compress these summary statistics if they have like low entropy. Um, but the like, problem there is, I guess, that entropy in general can be like even the mutual information is small, the entropy could be pretty high. So the positive results still apply, right? Positive results apply, but I want to put a bound on how much I'm sure. Talk about the lower bounds. Even possible is that I wanted to know, I give you like 100, 100 kilobytes, like store as much as you yeah. want, go back as much as you want, doesn't matter, but I mean, a lot of What is the parameter of the company? Anyway, like I think so you're out of time. Good question, yeah. yeah. And, uh, Thanks, Lelix. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks.